Are you looking for a church? If that's the case, there's a wide variety of denominations to choose from. An online post entitled, How Many Christians Are in the World Today? by LearnReligions.com states, According to the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, there are approximately 41,000 Christian denominations and organizations in the world today. Many of these denominations have radically different teachings revolving around the nature of God, heaven, hell, salvation, prayer, the Ten Commandments, and Bible prophecy, to name a few. For example, some churches claim that God is a trinity, while others claim that He isn't. Some will tell you that you need to keep God's commandments, while others will tell you that we're not under the law anymore. Some churches will tell you that we go straight to heaven or hell when we die, while others say God's judgment has to take place first. One major church claims that you need to pray to Jesus' mother or the saints so they can make supplication for you, even though you don't find examples of that in the Bible. One church adds to the Bible with a book they call Another Testament of Jesus Christ, with revelations that contradict what is written in the inspired scriptures. There's even one church that invented their own version of the Bible to suit their doctrines, which claim Jesus is not divine and you have to call God Jehovah. And the list goes on. These are just a few contradictions that you find among some professed Christian churches today. In addition, all of these denominations claim they are God's church. But with so many contradictions among them, that can't be right. That's confusing. And 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So how do you find a good church to go to? And does God have a specific denomination He endorses today? That's what I'm going to be addressing in this video. But before I do, I want to thank Give Glory to Him for sponsoring this video. Give Glory to Him is a Christian music ministry on YouTube, and they have a lot of inspiring Christian music videos with stories as to how some of the most popular hymns came about. I highly recommend that you check out their most recent upload by clicking on the card in the upper right hand corner of the screen. It's the story and song to the popular hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe to Give Glory to Him. Now back to how to find a good church. Before I get into that though, I want to ask you what do you think is important to look for when searching for a good church? Let me know in the comments section. Now, even though the Bible doesn't come out and say that you need to join a particular denomination, like the Baptist Church or the Catholic Church or something like that, it does give us some guidelines to help us find a good church. For example, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 4 tells us, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. The church is the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 explains how believers are all individual members of Christ's body, which is the church. Verses 27 through 28 read, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the church. Notice how the words body and church were used synonymously here. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, etc. So that tells us that God does have and He always has had a particular church which He has called believers into. In New Testament times, that was pretty easy to identify because there was initially only one body of Christian believers centered in Jerusalem. For instance, in speaking about Paul and Barnabas, Acts chapter 15 verse 4 says, And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. The church at Jerusalem sent missionaries out like the apostle Paul to convert the Gentiles, which led to the establishment of churches in Rome, Corinth, and Ephesus, to name a few. But these were not separate churches per se, they were groups of believers that adopted the same beliefs as the church in Jerusalem. By today's standards, that would be considered the same denomination of Christianity. However, as time went on, many groups calling themselves Christians began emerging with differing beliefs. 
more confirmation that God has always had a specific church that he has called believers into is found in John chapter 10 verse 16. There Jesus said, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus spoke of one specific fold that he calls believers into. Today we have thousands of folds to choose from. But now we're going to start narrowing them down to find the one that Jesus is calling us into today. Revelation chapter 12 verse 17 says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. A woman in the Bible symbolizes a church. For example, the parable of the ten virgins symbolizes the church at the return of Jesus Christ. Notice how the dragon who symbolizes the devil according to Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 makes war with the remnant of the woman's or church's seed. A remnant is the last remaining portion of something, so this is talking about God's end time church. And this woman or church is characterized by two key features. It keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus Christ. The fact that this church keeps the commandments of God really narrows down our search for God's church for today because most churches aren't keeping all of the commandments of God. Some churches teach that Christians don't have to keep the Ten Commandments because we are not under the law anymore, we are under grace. That comes from a misunderstanding of what not being under the law means and how grace works. Grace does not give us liberty to sin, it gives us liberty from sin. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 2 puts it this way, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not! How shall we, who died to sin, live any longer in it? Other churches do teach their members to keep the Ten Commandments, but only to a point. They claim that the Fourth Commandment, the one that tells us to keep the Sabbath holy, does not apply to Christians anymore or has been changed to Sunday. They try to support this claim with a handful of misinterpreted Bible verses. But Jesus made it clear that he did not come to change or abolish any of the Ten Commandments. He said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Being called least in the kingdom of heaven doesn't mean that those who intentionally break God's commandments and teach others to do so are going to hold a lower position in heaven or something like that. It means they will be judged least worthy to enter into heaven. By the way, if you're not familiar with the Ten Commandments, you can read them in Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 through 17. So if you want to find a good church, find one that teaches people to keep all of the commandments of God, including the fourth commandment, which tells us to keep the seventh day Sabbath holy. But that's easier said than done because even among Sabbath-keeping churches, there are numerous denominations. An online post entitled, Sabbath Observing Denominations, Sabbath Churches, by the Ten Commandments.org, has a directory of Sabbath churches worldwide, which lists 500 Sabbath-keeping churches or denominations in existence today. In addition, it states, Some of the largest Sabbath-keeping churches would be the Seventh-day Baptist, Seventh-day Adventist, Church of God, and the United Church of God. But this last one still unnecessarily keeps the feast days that ended at the cross. The Seventh-day Adventist Church understands Bible prophecy better than any other churches I have investigated, but they are attacked by people more fiercely than you can ever imagine. That's a significant statement because remember, Revelation chapter 12 verse 17 says the dragon, or Satan, was wroth, which means enraged, with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. So whatever church God is calling people to be a part of in the end times, you can expect that Satan will be fiercely attacking it. 
And in terms of the Seventh-day Adventist Church having a good understanding of Bible prophecy, Revelation chapter 12 verse 17 says God's end time church has the testimony of Jesus Christ. When you cross-reference that to Revelation chapter 19 verse 10, it says, The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is another way of saying the gift of prophecy through the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who gives believers an understanding of prophecy. It's one of the gifts of the Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 10. And I must confess, I personally haven't found any other church that explains prophecy better than the Adventist church. And that's one of the reasons why I became a Seventh-day Adventist. When it comes to Bible prophecy, the Adventist church uses a historic method of interpretation known as historicism. Historicism teaches that the prophecies of Revelation span through the history of the church and started being fulfilled in John the Revelator's time. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 supports this, stating, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. This is the same method of prophetic interpretation that was used by the Protestant Reformation. Unfortunately, many Protestant churches today have abandoned historicism for futurism. Futurism teaches that most of the prophecies from the book of Revelation will be fulfilled sometime in the future, just before the return of Jesus Christ. And it's worth noting that the father of futurism was a Jesuit priest by the name of Francisco Ribera. Francisco Ribera was commissioned by the Catholic Church to invent a prophetic interpretation that would combat historicism because historicism identified the papacy as the Antichrist, and the Catholic Church didn't like that very much. So Francisco Ribera invented futurism, which most of the Protestant world has now accepted. By the way, if you want a really good book explaining all of this in more detail, I highly recommend End Time Delusions by Steve Wahlberg. I'll leave a link to it in the video description. It's one of my favorite books about Bible prophecy. And before I continue, I might as well tell you, I think the Seventh-day Adventist Church is God's true church for the end time. But I'm not done yet. There's one more characteristic that really sets the Adventist Church apart from other churches, even Sabbath-keeping churches. And that is, it preaches the three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 verse 14 symbolically illustrates the second coming of Jesus Christ. It says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. The Son of Man is a title that Jesus frequently used for himself, and a few verses in the Bible describe Jesus as coming on the clouds of heaven at his second coming. For example, Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. He is pictured as having a golden crown because he is the king of heaven and his time to reign has come. And he is pictured with a sickle in his hand to gather the harvest of his saints to take them to heaven. Right before this event, that is, the second coming of Jesus, verses 6 through 12, mention the three angels' messages that get preached to the world. Some aspects of these messages include the everlasting gospel, true worship, God's judgment, the fall of Babylon, and the mark of the beast. No other denomination, aside from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, emphasizes the three angels' messages today. It is the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to preach the three angels' messages to the world before the second coming of Jesus Christ. If this intrigues you and you would like to find a Seventh-day Adventist Church near you, I would like to help you with that. Please DM me on Instagram and tell me your location and let me know that you would like me to help you find a church. You can find a link to my Instagram account in the video description. If that doesn't work for you, please email me at bibleflockbox at gmail.com. Or you can simply use Google Maps. Many Seventh-day Adventist churches are registered on Google Maps, and if you live in a big city, you may be able to find one within walking distance or a short drive from your home. 
it would probably be a good idea to make contact with the church by calling them to make sure the location is still valid though and that they will have service when you plan on attending. God has always had a particular church that he has called people into. In early New Testament times, it wasn't as confusing as today to find a good church because there was initially only one church to choose from. However, today, there are thousands of denominations and churches who claim to be God's church and who try to convince people to join them. In addition, these churches have a wide variety of beliefs, which can make it confusing for some people to find which one is the best church to join. Fortunately, the Bible gives us several guidelines to help us identify God's church today. God's church is described as a commandment-keeping church that has a good understanding of prophecy and makes it their goal to preach the three angels' messages to the world. There's really only one denomination that does that today, and that's the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Personally, I became a Seventh-day Adventist about 16 years ago after learning about the doctrines of the church. The teachings of the Adventist Church are very biblical, and at the time, I was looking for a church that faithfully taught God's Word. If you're an Adventist, let me know how Jesus led you to the Adventist Church in the comments section. Your message can inspire those thinking about checking out the Adventist Church, and I would like to read your story as well. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you're new, and click the bell, then click all in the menu that appears, and make sure notifications are turned on in your YouTube app on your mobile device so you don't miss any of my future uploads. Click on the screen to watch my video entitled God's Final Warning to the World if you would like to learn more about the three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14. Feel free to like and share this video if you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching and God bless you.